The better the university, the greater the danger. Imagine being raised in a religion that teaches this message to young people, that going to university and using your critical thinking skills is dangerous because it could cause you to turn away from the indoctrinated thinking of your upbringing. Of course, they wouldn't put it that way, but that's basically the reason. So today what I thought I would do is run a mock bibliotherapy session on the topic of education using excerpts from memoirs of former Jehovah's Witness women. I want to do this because at the time of this recording, school is about to start this week. It's the weekend before, before the new school year. And as someone who is a college educator, who's completed a, a master's degree in education, I know there's value in education. Having said that, there's also value in informal education. So if you are not in a position to go to college or university for whatever reason, or you're forbidden from going to college or university, perhaps you're still under the, um, under the thumb, <laughs> under the control of a, a, a cult or a, a fundamentalist religion or belief system. You know, there are other ways that you can educate yourself. Bibliotherapy is really the healing power of books. Probably many of us have read a book that we found catharsis in or that we learned something from, we discovered new things, or maybe even just were entertained by the book. So bibliotherapy uh, is, a, is a term that's been around since World War I. It isn't something that's really a, a household name, I guess you could say, but it really just talks to the healing power of books. Bibliotherapy as a, as a practice, as an intervention, uh, whether clinical or non-clinical, <clears throat> really helps people with their well-being, their mental health, and helps to reduce social isolation. Often because when we're reading about other people's experiences that mirror ours, we realize we're not alone and we often uh, find our voice in those, in those readings. So one of my my jobs is as a bibliotherapy facilitator for a local nonprofit. So what I really thought would be um, an enjoyable experience today because we're, we're approaching a new school year is to do a bibliotherapy session uh, based on education, particularly with those who have been forbidden an education. Now I'm going to share excerpts of former Jehovah's Witness women from their from their memoirs, but I'm also well aware that there are many other uh, fundamentalist belief systems that forbid women from getting an education. So let's get started. So the first book we're going to read from is uh, this book, Visions of Glory by Barbara Grizzuti Harrison. It was published in 1978, but she was a witness in the 50s and, and 60s in that time period. So it's, uh, it's interesting to read her perspective um, on the messages about education even back then and see how they translate to the way things are even today. So I'll read just the parts in pink. When everything is given by God's organization, nothing more is required. It was thought to be worse than redundant. It was thought to be a mark of contempt for God's channel for a young witness to go to a college or university. In sending a child to college at the present time, Russell wrote, parents should feel a great trepidation, a great fear, lest this outward polish to the wisdom of the world should efface all the polish of faith and character and heart, which they as the parents and proper instructors of the child had been bestowing upon it from infancy and before. Russell believed that the danger of rationalistic teachings called higher criticism, evolution, etc., was so great that one should be content with such education as could be obtained in the public schools and high schools or preparatory schools. With typical American entrepreneurial mentality, Russell pontificated. 
By the time the youngster has had six years schooling in practical business, the probabilities are that he will be much better able to cope with present conditions than the youth who has spent the same number of years under college training. And with smug Philistini Philistinism, he added, we write with full consciousness that to the worldly minded, this advice is foolishness or worse. Since Russell's time, nothing has changed. Parents are still reminded that they must render an account to God who has placed in their hands the responsibility to convey his desires to children. So it's interesting that Harrison wrote this or published the book in 1978, but she says that since Russell's time, nothing has changed. Well, fast forward 50 years and since <laughs> Harrison's time, nothing has changed. That opening quote that I started with came from a uh, JW broadcasting episode back in 2016. So the message from the late 1800s when the organization uh, was formed, the message about higher education being dangerous to, to young people, the message then has continued to this day. One interesting comment that Barbara makes about her childhood as someone who is, who is trained uh, to study, to read, to learn, she was perceived of as too smart to play with certain witness children. So in this part, she says, many witness kids were forbidden to play with me because I was judged to be too smart for my own good, for their own good. And I suspect because my mother's beauty and her highly effectual proselytizing evoked jealousies that could not be expressed. I remember once feeling sophisticated and daring, using a Bobby Soxer word, devastating. To quote her, she says, this fudge Sunday is devastating. And a witness mother pounced. She had been waiting. Only Jehovah can devastate, she said fiercely the fire of the Inquisition burning in her eyes, and she forbade her daughter, my best friend, to play with me. I was 10 years old. I have never forgiven her cruelty, the tears I shed on her account. I think she shares the sentiment that a lot of us who were, were raised this way share is that there's there's a an air of, of judgmentalist judgmentalism, a, a churchy self-righteousness or ju judginess that we, we often experience. And it when it comes to being smart and and conveying your intelligence in the, the words you use, your vocabulary. If it shows your intelligence, you can be perceived as, you know, full of yourself or arrogant or, or too smart for your own good, whatever that means. So further in the book, she talks about how um, the attitude toward education didn't change. She mentioned that it didn't change, but she goes on to say, the witnesses have not seen fit to change their views on education. Why bother with devil knowledge? Why imperil your standing with the all-knowing God? To what practical uses can a college education possibly be put? For the witnesses, all knowledge must be practical, utilitarian. At the Watchtower Bible Missionary School of Gilead, established in 1942 for full-time preachers, no humanities are taught and no creative arts. I have, as a consequence of this attitude towards worldly wisdom, known witnesses who have not read a single book or magazine not published by the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society for 20 years. I am still amazed at my own youthful temerity. Defiantly, when I was at Bethel headquarters, I smuggled New Yorkers into the building, locking myself into an unused guest room to read them. Raise high the roof beam, carpenters. Salinger, I then thought, would know me, would understand me, and I loved, love him for that. Of course, I did what I was told and did not go to college. In high school, I took a commercial and then a cooperative course, going to school and working in the office of a tool and die factory on alternate weeks. I was the despair of my teachers who pleaded with me to take college preparatory courses. I protested, rebutted, denied, 
but in the unredeemed, unredeemable part of my God-possessed heart, that tiny corner which denied him access, I longed to do what I explained I could not, in good conscience do. If anyone had picked me up bodily, bound and shackled, and deposited me on any campus in the Western world, I would have considered it a deliverance. Mephistopheles could have had my soul for the price of a course in freshman English. I ached, wanting so much to be one of them, despising my own longings when I saw booklading college students. I seldom allowed my mind to know what my heart was doing. Vice was the Flatbush Avenue bus. I rode the Flatbush Avenue bus, pretending to be on my way to Brooklyn College, hoping that someone would mistake me for one of those privileged people free to learn and to explore. And all this time, I believed that I still believed. I preached with fervor and conviction. My life was a crazy quilt of conflicted desires. College was the Tower of Babel. I harbored secret longings to go to college. I was gratified when my intelligence was respected by my teachers. I really feel for her in this writing because you can just, you can hear the longing in her, in her reflections of that time, like wanting so much to learn and, and to be a part of this learning process, you know, not even just being a one of the college students fitting in with a college student but being a part of learning of of growing your mind and and just developing your intelligence and developing your intellect she just wanted to be a part of that she just wanted to learn she had a craving and a desire to learn which was well at least in the university context or a college context denied so I find it interesting also that even in high school, she took commercial and cooperative courses. I did the same thing. I took a co-op in, in high school. College and university was never something that was promoted in, in my household, pr probably not in yours either. But it's interesting how her teachers, she says here, they pleaded with her to take college prep courses because they saw her potential and even she saw her potential, but she squashed it because she wouldn't be able to realize her potential. The, the messaging about trying to exercise your potential is that you're, you know, full of yourself or, or arrogant or you have airs about yourself. So I really, I really felt her pain in this reading. One interesting book that I came across online, I don't know if you'd be able to it's a, it's a graphic novel, and I, I think it's the only graphic novel that I'm aware of, at least, written by a former Jehovah's Witness woman, kind of as a, as a graphic novel slash memoir, talking about their experience. And I was curious to see if they would have anything on education in, um, in the chapters, and I did. I came across two, two pages, one on college and then one called The Reason for the Lack of Education. And you'll notice on the left side where there's the pink arrow that says me at 16, says, Dad, I really enjoyed my law class at school today. And then the father says, why the heck do you need that? And then you can see the sadness in her eyes. I want job skills. And then the father's response, just drop out and marry one of my friend's sons. Like, like that's a solution to happiness, right? We all know that that is not the way. <laughs> Marriage is not the way to happiness. I'm not saying education is the way to happiness either, but certainly marriage is not. Um, and then under the heading of the reason for it, the lack of education, I'm not going to read all the, the different parts there, but you can see in the, in the top quadrant there, the, the demands on your, on your time as one of Jehovah's Witnesses is like your your, your time is consumed with activities in the congregation, activities you're expected to participate in and perform in because people are watching you and judging you. And if you don't participate and don't perform, then you're looked down upon. You're not, not regarded very highly in a social context. Also, I find it interesting, you see those three um, 
three sections there where you've got disability, welfare, and lack of health care. And these are consequences to not having a decent education in order to get employment that pays for you to live a quality of life that at least allows you to be able to uh, go to the doctor or the dentist and get basic health care. So this is a really interesting graphic novel, but I, I really appreciate that Grand and Bolin took the time to highlight the, the impact of not having an education, how this affected them and how it, um, how it affects other young people. In the bottom bottom left corner, you see, you know, ten years later, the the up the the one on the top with her dad, she was sixteen, and then the one on the bottom, and she says, "Me at twenty six, you can see I enrolled in an online college today." And then all of her girlfriends are hugging her and saying, "Well, my kids will go to college too, just like you." So sometimes all you need is time and just the right opportunity to be in the right position in life to be able to take advantage of going to college or university if that's what you desire. It might just be a matter of having some patience before you get there, but you you will get there if that's what you want. Now this next excerpt is from Leaving the Witness by Amber Scora. And I remember when I read this, <laughs> these, these chapters, this part, I was... I felt so angry. And the reason why, um, we'll, we'll read about what happens, but you know, I spent six years completing my undergrad part-time. I started when I was 34 and I graduated university with my bachelor's degree at age 40. So I stuck it out. I busted my hump for six years to get that degree. I, you know, I earned it, so to speak. And then later went on to pursue a master's degree. So like 10 years of my life, pursuing a university education in order to be able to work in education, in order to to set myself up to be a teacher. Because if you want to be an educator in, you know, in the systems, whether it's the elementary, secondary, or college or university systems, you need university degrees. Usually at least one, two, and sometimes three if you want to be a university professor. So when I read this part, which we're about to read together, you can imagine why I was really ticked off. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to read the parts marked in yellow. After a week of looking, my husband found a part-time job in an English kindergarten teaching, just as many foreigners do when they come to China. Neither of us had gone to university and therefore normally would never have qualified for a teaching position, nor been able to get a legitimate work visa for that matter. But a few years before, at a time when fake degrees were showing up for $99 on the internet, a scam more holy in nature popped up in the Jehovah's Witness community. This involved a university in an American town I had never heard of, making its online degrees a notch less fake by crediting the preaching hours Jehovah's Witnesses had done as work experience that could be put towards offsetting the four years worth of time required in class to achieve a bachelor's degree. In reality, there was no time in class, but instead you wrote a thesis essay and took a 300-question, multiple-choice, open-book exam and were then awarded your piece of paper. The Watchtower magazines that we handed out to the public touted us as the most honest, upright people in the world. That being said, most of us who were trying to sell ourselves as English teachers in order to support ourselves in our preaching work had been admonished not to pursue education beyond a basic high school diploma. This created a difficulty because the governing body was encouraging people to go to foreign lands to preach, and to do that, we needed jobs. Most jobs for foreigners in other countries involved teaching or having some other specialized skill. For obvious reasons, earning a degree at an actual university that would have taught critical thinking skills and emphasized training for a successful career was not permissible. And sure enough, almost any witness I knew who had rebelled against this edict was eventually disfellowshipped for something or another. But this $3,000 scam degree was no problem at all. 
In fact, it was encouraged by some of those in higher up positions who reminded us of a Bible principle I have since seen the governing body use to lie in child abuse court cases, theocratic warfare, meaning if being dishonest will do something to advance Jehovah's will, then it's okay to make an exception and to keep one's clean conscience. Therefore, many of us pioneer missionaries jumped at the chance to get a fake degree. We avoided the dangers of higher education by paying $3,000 to write whatever double-spaced essay we were capable of and fill out some multiple choice circles in pencil. Just reading that again makes my blood boil. What an insult to all of the people who put in the work and the time and the struggle to get a post-secondary education so that they can be trained teachers <laughs> to help other people when good old, honest, God-fearing Jehovah's Witnesses are out there getting fake university degrees. As you can imagine, that's very vexing to, to people that uh, put in the work. Another book that I read is Shunned, so I included an excerpt from, from Shunned in here. And again, it talks to, you know, the potential that people see in us, whether it's teachers or, or family or friends, employers, the, the potential that they see and the, the expectation that will act on that potential, because that's just common sense, generally speaking, right? So here she wrote, Growing up, I never felt a sustained closeness with Grandma T, a nickname she encouraged. Like the rest of my father's family, she was not a witness, and we had limited contact with the worldly side of the family. She was always kind to me, though, and I thought of her with fondness. I recall her dismay with my choice to skip college and go into full-time pioneer work. You're smart, Lindy, she said. Think of all the goodness you could bring to the world if you had an education. At the time, I dismissed her point of view. I was pursuing a noble path and believed that I had been taught chasing higher education would distract me from my spiritual ideals. Armageddon would soon come, followed by the new system here on earth. Calling attention to that event was my way of serving humanity. I always assured grandma that my spiritual education would be more than sufficient to get me through the time remaining in this old doomed system. She'd roll her eyes and take a sip of tea. <laughs> I have a feeling that Linda Curtis herself, when she reflects back on her decisions and, and the way she used to think about education back then, would cause her to roll her eyes and take a sip of whatever. <laughs> When we use this kind of logic that the world is coming to an end at, at Armageddon, um, and this is why we're not going to realize our potential and you know get an education, it's it's distressing to them and hard for them to get their wrap their heads around because you know it doesn't make any sense. We're not making sense. So this next part is from the la the last days by Allie Miller. There's a couple of pages that I have here from that. And this particular chapter is called Knowledge is a Great Vanity, where she shares the story of meeting with her career counselor, kind of the, the conversation that took place there. Uh, but what I find interesting is that the, the first excerpt that I'm going to read really talks to how, you know, when you're raised as one of Jehovah's Witnesses, they kind of raise you to be a student. All of the activities that we have to do on a on, had to do on a regular basis during the week kind of trained you to be a studier, trained you to be a student. Not that we liked it, to be honest. Probably a lot of people still don't like it, but nevertheless, you you were trained that way. So in the first part, she says, every week we still prepare for Sunday. Sunday's Watchtower study together, reading the paragraphs, underlining the answers to the questions at the bottom of the page. We also prepare for the Theocratic Ministry School and for the book study on a Tuesday evening and for the ministry on Saturday, and we do the Bible readings. It never changes. And then further down, she says, my head hurts every time we read the society's literature, just like it hurt this morning when we read the day's text and mom said I had to read it twice so I could memorize it for today. 
The day's text is a protection when I'm at school. I'm meant to remember it when I come under trial. I think mum thinks the careers office might be a trial. So here the career counselor is asking her a bunch of questions um, so that she can kind of do an assessment of, of what to recommend career-wise for Allie. So here on, on the left side, it says, it's difficult to answer her questions, especially when she asks me what I do outside of school. I can't tell her how many hours a week I spend at the meetings or on the ministries or studying. I'm not even sure what I do like doing. I tell her I like reading. I tell her I like writing, even though I don't write poems as often as I used to, and my diary entries are beginning to make less and less sense. I tell her I like acting because I'm really good at drama. I pause and she's still sitting nodding at me, which I think means I'm to keep talking, so I start scraping the barrel. I say I love horse riding, and even though I've not been to the stables for years, she nods again. This is getting tricky. I tell her I like riding my bike and worry she'll suggest the Tour de France. She gives me a smile and nods really enthusiastically. Anything a little more academic? She says she could have been more specific the first time. Oh, I say, well, English lit, of course. All the girls love English lit. It would be some sort of aberration not to love it. History too, I say. I'm really good at it. So it's it's kind of cute, right? The recollection of being in the career counselor's office and the career counselor's coming at the, the interaction from a, what can I suggest for you for your future based on the direction of your education, you know, cause it's a, it's at a school, this meeting, but when you're raised, not with not having that goal in mind and you're asked questions about what do you like to do uh, you don't really think of things in terms of what do i like to do and what would i like to do for my education what would i like to do for uh, the betterment of my my career and and my life out in the world once i finish school further in her conversation with the career counselor she says Yes, she says, someone with your academic caliber will obviously be thinking about university. Have you given some thought to where you want to go? I'm confused. I think of how the other girls throw around words like York and Durham and lately sixth form college, but these are words for other people. Mom's never once mentioned university to me or college. I'm just not going. There was enough of a fuss when Zoe stayed on at school at 16. The elders came to the house to tell mom it was a bad idea. They said all the extra learning was unnecessary and would only take Zoe away from the truth. Mom had had to fight hard for them to listen to her. When they left, she said, would they have done this if I was a man, I wonder? That was the only time I'd ever heard her say anything against the organization. That's a very powerful <laughs> excerpt right there because it it really talks to the challenges of women in the organization on on many different levels wanting to go to school is one thing but even just you know being questioned like having to advocate for for yourself and your family and your and your children when it's your decision as the parent and your decision as the young person going to university or college, whether or not that's something you want to do. Why do the men in this organization feel it is their place to even question you? It's a, it's a quite a, a head scratcher. But yeah, again, here the career counselor is acknowledging her potential, saying someone with your academic caliber is clearly thinking of going to university. Why wouldn't you be? And here she was like, I'm just not going because she was never prepared to even make that decision. Didn't know she could, or perhaps she was being prevented from making that decision at that time. I like the uh, uh, the paragraph, the the highlighted area on the on the right side as well. And the last sentence really says it all. You know, she's talking about the interaction with some friends. They're sharing what the career counselor, the advice the career counselor gave them, and and they're just talking naturally about you know school and careers and so on. And then she says, some people don't have a effing clue how lucky they are, how lucky they were to just be talking naturally about 
things that you should be able to talk naturally about your, your future and your education. In another part of Ali's book, she's talking again about education and refers to, you know, trying to make a decision, wanting, wanting to do something with her life and, and not being quite sure what direction to go in to, to do it, to pursue it. So in the, the part on the left-hand side, she says, I begin to think that maybe I could have a passion too, something just for me. Maybe I could learn to do something, but there's a danger in this. I would need to go somewhere to learn, university. It's not that I don't know people who've been. Mark has been to university. He likes to talk about his having gone, and I'm impressed by how clever it means he must be. But he also says it meant his dad wasn't allowed to give talks at the assembly while he was there. And so in a way, his family was punished for his choice. And this is interesting, this section. Mark was her, her husband at the time, and it's interesting how the fact that he went to university prevented his father from having pr privileges in the organization because you can't you can't have privileges or be a leader uh, sending the message that university is dangerous if you're allowing your children to go to university or encouraging them to go to university so sometimes not sometimes, often there's uh, double standards and, and uh, blatant hypocrisy within that organization. And then on the next page, she says, one hot June day, I began flicking through prospectuses I have gathered in my flat. I've decided I need to study something that's nearly vocational. Those kinds of courses are less frowned on. I'm not allowed to study philosophy. We are explicitly warned about this. I'd like to do English literature or history, but English literature means I'd have to study worldly books, and a lot of them would contain sex or drugs or other immoral things, so that's out. History doesn't have a clear career path afterwards, so I couldn't justify it. Instead, I find textiles. It sounds useful, like it will lead to gainful employment. I already know how to sew, and I've been making and designing my own clothes for ages. It doesn't sound too academic, so it's not going to make me think like a worldly person. It's perfect. I fold the page down. Soon I apply without telling anyone. Three weeks later, I'm offered an unconditional place. So this paragraph is, is really quite distressing, isn't it? Because so many young people in this situation they they live in fear they exist in fear of being judged of of being held accountable for making a decision about their own education their own future their own personal growth and development being questioned by uneducated men in the jehovah's witness religion it's really contrary, isn't it? It's con contrary to logic. But she liked philosophy. She liked English. She liked history. Those are the things that she felt a passion about, but she admits that she wouldn't have been allowed to study it because she would have been questioned. They were too academic. They didn't, they didn't have a practical application. So she landed on textiles. And hey, textiles I'm sure is, is great and useful and practical and I'm sure she learned a lot. But the point is that that wasn't her first choice. She had to make not her first choice in order to please the men in the organization, in order to abide by the ruling that university education is dangerous. So she avoided the danger by taking a textile program. Finally, towards the end of the book, she uh, refers to education one more time, where she says, one day there is a crash on the doormat, a brochure full of evening classes. We're always warned that our spare time was to be devoted to Jehovah, and evening classes were an unnecessary distraction. Although now I think of it, they didn't mind us going to the gym. <laughs> Maybe it was thinking there was a problem with. In a previous video, I mentioned how often when women leave the Jehovah's Witness religion, they end up pursuing post-secondary education along with other many other uh, personal growth and development activities like writing memoirs. And uh, 
I'm going to highlight two of those people next. Barbara Anderson, she's a, a household name with former Jehovah's Witnesses. If you're if you're not familiar with her work, just Google her and you'll see lots of videos and uh, interviews talking about the work she's done, the impactful, powerful work that she has done. So in her book, Uncensored, Eyewitness to Deceit, Discoveries of a Former Jehovah's Witness Insider, this is co-written with Richard Kelly. Um, she talks about education as well and it's interesting that well while she was at Bethel she was she had a a very privileged position being a researcher when a lot of women weren't allowed those kinds of privileges so she she had a unique insight it's almost like she was put there to discover things <laughs> that she was able to to use later on so in terms of just dealing with the with the topic of education I'll share what uh, she wrote here so six years after I left Bethel and one year after I no longer attended meetings, I went back to school. After taking some tests at the local community college, I received a two-year college scholarship. One of the required courses that I had to take was on critical thinking. What I learned in that class was a revelation to me as I did not think I needed to be taught how to think critically. Each of our stories of escape from Watchtower's mental prison is different, but the outcome is the same. We now can exercise our free will. We can ask questions that lead to discoveries. For me, out of the Watchtower means life's journey is one big adventure, one that I embarked on when I began to take college classes and felt the exhilaration of discovery. No wonder Watchtower leaders try to employ persuasive coercion to keep its members from attending university. And I'll repeat that quote that I started with. The better the university, the greater the danger. And I got that quote again from the JW Broadcasting, and I'll share that little excerpt with you right now. It is one thing to work on a job with others and quite another matter to immerse oneself in an institution of learning. Higher learning can easily influence thinking and attitudes. I have long said, the better the university, the greater the danger. The most intelligent and eloquent professors will be trying to reshape the thinking of your child and their influence can be tremendous. So the final person that I'm going to highlight today, the excerpt from, is uh, Bonnie Zeman. So she has several books, but this one is Fading Out of the JW Cult, a memoir. And I looked to see what she had to say about education in her memoir, because she's someone that went on to pursue post-secondary after leaving the religion as well. So here's what she had to say. After a few years of grief-flavored freedom, I decided to take some courses in psychology at a community college. Looking back now, I know I took those courses as much to try to resolve my inner JW-driven turmoil and neuroticism as to study the subject of psychology itself. Those basic courses led to enrolling in two therapy training programs one in Gestalt therapy, and then another called Psychosynthesis Psychotherapy, which ultimately took four years of study and training. Those psychotherapy training programs hold that a good psychotherapist must do their own personal therapy. So while studying the theory and the techniques to be a therapist, I had my own weekly much needed sessions with one. And further, she says, soon after, I applied to and was accepted at university studying in the Department of Applied Social Science of a sprawling big city university. Later, a master's degree in education, based on a thesis on adopting a model of exper experiential learning, Kolb, for use in conducting supervisions of student therapists, was earned. During several years of university study, I learned much about the basic needs of humans and the damage that is done when those fundamental needs are thwarted. I studied the dynamics, needs, and patterns of people in group settings, which are really interesting to apply to the Jehovah's Witness organization. All the study and training explained much to me about my experience within the cult and certainly affirmed my hard-won decision to leave. So it's really powerful that, you know, she studied 
psychology out of out of an interest in the topic, but also as a way for self understanding self awareness, and, and then ended up turning it into something that helps so many other people. So Bonnie Zeman is a shining example of someone who used education to not only their advantage, but to the advantage of others. She went on to write so many books and, and help so many people through basically having an, an understanding of what it's like to be someone who leaves a high control fundamentalist religion, someone who's been denied an education and then pursues it, finds the courage and the self-belief to start pursuing it and then use what she's learned to help others. There's there's a lot to be learned from that. And then also through writing a memoir, because if you're someone who's unable perhaps at this time to pursue studies, or maybe you're not interested in doing formal um, education studies, which is fine, you can do informal learning through through reading books of Bonnie Zeman, through reading memoirs, self-help books, really any kind of reading, which is the bibliotherapy effect, right? The healing power of books, uh, the healing power of reading. Well, I hope you've enjoyed this mock bibliotherapy session on the topic of education, specifically education for those who have been denied an education or who have had the programming from upbringing that university education is dangerous, like Jehovah's Witnesses are taught to believe. So if you're someone that has a desire to pursue education or feels like you've been denied that opportunity and and you haven't really been able to talk to anyone about it you're not you know you, you feel sort of alone hopefully through this discussion sharing excerpts from different memoirs that have spanned through the years even as far back as uh the 1978 when that first book was published that you're not alone uh, that your your voice is heard throughout these memoirs that other women have have felt let down and frustrated by not being able to perhaps pursue their dreams at a time when they were young and and had the you know it was the right time say for instance as a teenager graduating high school and people believing in you and and you know seeing your potential and yet you weren't allowed to exercise that potential at that time so hopefully now if you're in a position to exercise that potential and and pursue your goals hopefully you will take advantage of the opportunity to do that and if you're someone who's not really geared towards you know formal post-secondary education know that an informal education just through the act of reading books and learning new things is really just as valuable so hopefully you'll be back for more videos where i will do more bibliotherapy sessions on these topics particularly geared towards former jehovah's witness women so thanks for watching and be positive